Hey, coach, it's Joe Salas here, and welcome to Championship Culture. We have a special, special treat. We've got the legend, the grandfather of the air raid, uh, Coach Hal Mummy, is with us today, and uh, and he's going to answer the five questions. But I wanted to I wanted to start with this. Uh, you know, I, I think you know everyone knows that Coach Mummy was the you know the guru of the air raid, but really, Coach Mummy, I think was uh was doing culture before it was even called culture you know back in the day when uh you know in the early 90s and coach really there's so many things you were doing in the early 90s that are just normal now and i think building culture was one of them uh i remember your uh you know the two quotes i always use you know uh, how mummy quotes when surrounded by a superior force attack 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 and i remember the other one was uh, morale is equally as important as discipline. And that was kind of, uh, I remember the very first staff meeting at Valdosta State when you were preaching that. And, and to me, that translates to culture is, is, is a big deal today. And we just didn't have that word back then. Well, I think um, all the places I've been, we've kind of, we've used the same uh, outline. And it was always uh, one rule, don't hurt the team. I didn't want to have a lot of a list of rules that, that that people could break, and then you'd have to kick your best player off the team, you know. So I just told them we only have one rule, and that's don't hurt the team, and I'd be the judge of whether they hurt the team or not. And so then we built it from there with uh, three three things that I got from Bill Walsh that he always built the 49ers on, and that was uh, uh, honest effort in everything you do. And so that includes everything you do from the time you wake up in the morning till you go to bed at night. And so that includes class, it includes off season or practice, it includes uh, what you do off the field socially. So just give an honest effort, you know. And and uh, and then the second thing was communication. And for young people, even back then in the '90s, it was the same, but it's gotten even more intense now because of social media. They can communicate with almost anyone, but who you communi communicate with is the most important thing. So we're always encouraging them to communicate with their parents, their professors, uh, our staff, and, and their teammates. And, and uh, so try to hold your communications to that. You know, don't, don't invite outside uh, influences in, uh, particularly not now. It's become even more intense, as I said. And then loyalty, and, and loyalty was always just a, a series of petty trade-offs. Uh, you know, if the, if the meeting was going to start at three, show up at 10 till, you know, if the bus leaves at, at two o'clock, be there at one forty-five. just, it's just doing those little things so that you're the rest of your teammates don't have to suffer because you didn't take, you didn't take care of business. So that, that was, that was kind of the basis. And, and uh, it was, you know, build on those three aspects and don't hurt the team. So if you didn't do one of those aspects, then you hurt the team. So then they'd end up in my office, and they usually didn't enjoy it very much. And uh, but but after a while, you get so you don't have to do much of that, you know, because everybody buys in. And then to get them to buy in, I think one of the most important things we did at VSU, and I've done this other places, but was our our off season, where we had the team aspect of it. We split the guys into teams and and uh, kept points for everything they did. So if they got A's or B's on a paper, they got points for their team. If they got a, a D or an F on a paper, it took points away from their team. Um, every every exercise and every uh, off season uh, event, you know, like say the way coach has them running forties that day. Well, how they did that was great, and they got points or lost points, and. We had competitive games. Sometimes they're silly little games, you know, uh, little relay races and things of that nature. But we made them compete. And, again, they lost points or game points. And I've always been a big believer in that leaders rise to the top. And you hear, you hear coaches com complain a lot of times, well, they didn't have any leadership. Well, I, I don't think leadership just shows up in August in your off season, you have to create opportunities for there to be leaders. And if the coaches are always going to be the leaders, then when you show up in August, you're not going to have any leaders. So that's what those off season, those team games were for. 
And we, as you remember, we, each coach would have a team that he was assigned and we'd have the draft, we'd put everybody on the board. And, and we tried to even it out as much as we could uh, between upperclassmen, lowerclassmen, you know, uh, skill guys and linemen and uh, everything counted. In order to win those, those uh, super games, you had to, you had to really participate. And so that meant also making grades. You had to, because we, we put a lot of emphasis on academics. And so a lot of those guys, when they're younger, when they get to college, all they want to do is play football. And class isn't that important to them. So by doing this, it forced it to be important to them. And because of that, we'd usually end up, you know, with 15 or 20 teams after you split it up. There was usually about a half a dozen guys on each team. And they would go through and they'd compete. And then we'd have the contest at the end right before spring break and right before spring practice. And and so uh, it usually ended up in a, a huge tug of war was the finish game, you know, uh, for the championship, which was fun. Uh, you, you know, whatever your rules are, whatever league you're in or division you're in, you got different rules. You got to kind of adjust the games to that. But uh, I, I've always been a big believer in that. I got it from Grant Taft years ago and I always – thought it was a brilliant way to do off season besides just show up and run and lift weights. And uh, so that was a big part of the culture. I think it developed leadership for us. Well, I, and I remember two other things from that is number one, I, I think I remember you always made the final tug of war. You gave it enough points that it, that became like the Super Bowl. Like they were, yeah. you would put enough points on it that two or three teams had a chance of winning the whole thing. Yeah, we tried to narrow it down to like semifinals and then finals, and so you had to, you know, you'd pick the top four point getters, and then, and then, yeah, you had enough points so that whoever won won out would win it. And then, and then we'd give them, you'd have to pick up and give them a t-shirt or something, you know. Right, I think it was t-shirts. I, I, I yeah. had them for a long time. And then the other thing is, uh, you would have it was kind of a leadership development for your coaches because you would have your assistant coaches come out just on Friday and give, you know, their, their one talk in the off season. And you, and it, it wasn't you, you didn't come out or maybe you did it for the tug of war, but each coach cycled through there and gave that Friday motiv uh, motivational speech. And I, looking back now, I can see that was you kind of developing your coaches, developing their leadership also. Well, it, yeah, I think as the head coach, you, you, you need to mentor younger coaches. And we had certainly at Valdosta had a lot of younger ones like yourself pass through there. So I want to give you all a chance to let your personalities rise, not just be some uh, uh, anonymous person standing in the background all the time. So the off season is a great place to do that. And, and uh, it gets a little harder to do during the season because there's so much focus on the, the maybe the head coach or the coordinators. Right. Well, I, I, to this day, I remember, and we're getting sidetracked. I got to get to my five questions, but the, uh, yeah. when Mike Leach came out, you know, uh, he, when he came out, he started his talk, and you know how he does he does the, the soft talk. So he's talking yeah. real low, and kids aren't paying attention. They're not giving them respect. They're kind of screwing around. And as he got, and he's talking about a Clint Easterwood movie with the little brown cigarettes that he used to. And, and yeah. I'm, I'm, think, I'm watching it, and I'm thinking, what is he talking about? And it didn't take five minutes before he had captured that entire group, and they were hanging on every word that he said. And that was that was like the first time I saw the magic of Mike Leach, you know, because he, I think Wiley, John Wiley said one time, you know, that we had one coach on staff that appeared organized but wasn't, and then we had Leach who appeared unorganized but was, and that was kind of the that that showed it that he captured that group from not paying any attention to him to to everyone hanging on every word that he said, and that was that's because of what you were doing, you know, developing leadership out there. Well, he, he uh, you, you could tell right from the start, when I hired Mike at Iowa Wesleyan, I made him the O-line coach, and he'd never coached him before. And I wanted somebody really smart to do that, because in, in 1989, if you said you're going to play in a two-point stance for most of the game and have real big splits, and we're going to throw it 50 times a game, most O-line coaches would just get up and walk out of the room and and think you're crazy. So I, I was forced into hiring somebody who would just do what I told him to do. And, and then develop ways to do it. So the first, when he showed up in August in 1989, he, he wasn't there for the summer because he was coaching in Finland. And, uh, but he shows up around the first of August about the time the, the players do. 
So the first couple of days I thought, well, I'm going to go sit in on his meetings to make sure this guy's doing things right. You know? And I, uh, Joe, I think I only sat in on two meetings the whole time he was with me. Cause I, after it, it was, I, I was just like the kids. I mean, he, he'd walk in, he'd start talking. He's, he's got some, some benign story to tell, you know, that, that doesn't have anything to do with anything. And all of a sudden he's got everybody hanging on the edge of their seats and you can tell that uh, in his mind, he knows exactly the way this stuff's supposed to look and how we're going to get to it. And so I only went to like two of his meetings because I had other things to do. I didn't need to over, over look over his shoulder. And that's the last time I ever sat in on any of his meetings. But he, 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 he is brilliant. And, and he, he, he is totally, it's one of the reasons we never had to have a playbook because we just knew what we wanted to do and went on the field. And, and there wasn't any reason to write all this stuff down. In fact, it kind of works against you. You know, those things tend to get out in the public and well, people start studying what you're doing and all that kind of stuff. So we just, you know, for years and years and years, we just never really had a playbook. Well, it's funny you just said that because my daughter just redid our game room and I had to pull all my boxes out of there and all my books. And I found that original Valdosta playbook that you got. <laughs> You gave it out, yeah. you took it right back. You like you like they only had it for a week or a week and you took it back. Well, we had uh, I'll tell you a funny story about that. Guy Morris joined our staff there, as you remember, and Guy was the NFL guy. So to him not having a playbook was sacrosanct and, and so uh he he begged and pleaded. And so finally Mike and I that first spring break said, Okay, we'll do it during spring break. And so Mike and Guy and I sat up there, and I, I think Scott Preston sat in on it some, and maybe uh, David, uh, our receiver, the, the guy that went to West Georgia, David. Um, Dean, David Dean. Dean, David Dean. I'm sorry, I couldn't remember his last name. But he, they, uh, they all sat in on it. And, you know, after about three or four days, Mike and I got bored, and we just said, the hell is this, we're going to the beach. And so Guy finished the book out. Well, Guy didn't really know. He knew the offensive line play, but he didn't really know a lot of the nuances of the other stuff. And so he finished this book out, and we, he put it behind his desk. And, and for years, it was the only copy of an air raid playbook, and, and, and about a third of it probably wasn't even correct. And uh, he, he carried that book with him everywhere he went. He'd have it in his credenza behind the desk. It, when he left us, he took it to the Cardinals. And when he left the Cardinals, he took it to Mississippi State. And, then when I hired him back at Kentucky, he had it behind his. I, I walked in his office. There it was, sitting behind his, you know, on his, behind his desk. And so then two years go by, and we do real good. And Mike gets Bob Stoops hires Mike at Oklahoma. And so that first spring there, Mike's got all these guys like Mark Mangino and Steve Spurrier Jr. and uh, you know just all these great football coaches, uh, uh, Jonathan Hayes, all these guys that are going to go on to be great coaches. Well, he's in charge of all these guys. And they, we're going to run – we're going to – Bob had made it real clear we're running air raid offense. So, Bob tells Mike about a week before spring practice, I need your playbook at the end of the week. So, Mike calls me up. He's in a panic. He goes, I got to have a playbook. We never had a playbook. I said, well, just draw one up. And he goes, well, we only – you know, he, he said the defense has got a real organized one. and I said, well, if I was you, I'd call up Guy and tell him to run a copy of that one we made at Valdosta. He just turned that in. So he did. I went in the office the next day at UK, and Guy's in the, in the, in the copy room running off his playbook. I said, oh, I see Mike got a hold of you, huh? And he goes, yeah, I'm going to do it for him. I'm sitting over to him. So a whole year goes by. Mike gets the job at Texas Tech. Bob calls me up and says, look, I still want to run air raid offense, but I, I got to teach. Would you would you let Mangino and Chuck Long come over to Kentucky and study for a week so they can learn how to call it? So they come over. We spend a whole week with them, show them everything we do. They they uh, and this was the year they would go on to win the national championship. They they come and they they get everything. And so the last day we're there, and and man, and Mangino says, Coach, I got one question. I said, What's that? And he goes, Well, Mike gave us this playbook last year. And, you know, there was about a third of it. We didn't even – it wasn't even right. We didn't even do any of that stuff. <laughs> and I just died laughing. I told them the story I just told you, and they started dying laughing. <laughs> and then when I went to work in the XFL with Coach Stoops, we were talking one day about Leach, and I told him the same story. <laughs> he just cracked up. <laughs> he said, yeah, 
<laughs> it's probably a little over. Playbooks are probably a little overrated. <laughs> well, I, you know, I went. We we've uh, we've used that playbook, but we did it. You know, all we knew was what you taught us. So yeah, we would have. You know, we made copies of that playbook, and we would we would hand it out during summer camp and take it right back up after yeah. summer camp. And yeah, well, it's, it's kind of made it way around. It again. Yeah, people tell me once in a while they bought it on eBay. You know, it's made its way around, but yeah, you, you got to kind of beware. Some of it's not right. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Well, I was looking through there. I was like, I didn't. I've never seen this one. So yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, it was just Dino funny. Was I found that thing last night because I, yeah. because she was working on that room. All right, so obviously, how mummy, uh, high level of charisma, and and you you did it to me right here. So I got to get I got to get on this uh, five questions. Okay. And the first one, the first one's funny because everyone that watches my YouTube channel and everyone that's gonna listen to this podcast knows who you are. But it, we start out with, can you give me a one minute elevator introduction? Um, Hal Mummy, head football coach, a lot of places in the past, and. Uh, Hope to be again soon, and and uh, Mike Leach and I developed the air raid, what's known as air raid offense. Uh, the very first one was August 31st, 1991, at Iowa Wesleyan College, and it was uh, after about for myself about eight, eight years of putting together things from BYU and the run and shoot, and and uh, I owe a debt of gratitude to Mouse Davis and Lavelle Edwards and June Jones and people like that, John Jenkins. Um, but it, it's it's been a fun ride, and, and uh, hopefully we get to do it some more. Well, you 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 dang, you've helped a whole lot of people along the way, and I, I I told that story before we started. But you know, uh, well, we'll talk about that when you talk about your system at the end. Uh, number two question: What is your definition of culture? You know, that's the big buzzword now. Well, I think it's what we were describing at the beginning. Here is is just being able to set the parameters, have a way to teach them. And then uh, try to try to uh, realize that you got to be more positive than you are negative. And so I've always had kind of a in the back of my mind a rule that if I was going to get on somebody really hard, I was also going to pick some time to praise him really well and and try to praise him about three times for every time you get on him. Um, you know, sometimes you run into guys where that's not possible, <laughs> but but you try. You know, you got to try. Well, that that would be one thing I, I if I was going to describe your program was there was always a positive vibe around the uh, around the program, and I I've been on the wrong end of a butt chew a how mummy butt chewing many times, and you had a you had a unique way of never raising your voice, and, but you you could you could uh, you could get on someone without ever raising your voice without ever yelling, but there there's a couple times when you were getting on me and I was sitting there thinking to myself don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> so, but, but the, there was, there was a positive buzz always around the program. And, you know, that had a lot to do with your charisma and your, uh, just, the uh, you know, you had that, that little thing on your desk, you know, run, gun and have fun. And I mean, I, I feel like you built the whole program that way, that it was about throwing the football and having fun and, and, uh, you know, and working hard, but, but there was, it was always positive. Uh, well, I, I think that was that was during a period when we were football was beginning needed to change because if it didn't change we were going to lose the sport all, all the best players like when I went to Coppers Cove High School in 1986 the four best players the four best athletes in the school didn't play football when I left there three years later they were the all district quarterback and three of the all district receivers so you had to you had to find a way to start having fun playing the game and and that was right at kind of the changing point right there. At Valdosta, and that that's a you know we're almost exactly there now with trying to get the middle schools and the rec programs to throw the football to run the air raid and throw the football is that the whole thing of getting the numbers out and getting the athletes back out to play football because down in those levels it's still three yards in a cloud of dust so that that's kind of the the newest thrust with the air raid is getting it into the middle school and there's a, believe it or not there's a lot of guys in the middle school that are slinging it around and really running that rate at a high level. Well, you remember, like when I was a kid at that age, 10, 11, 12, 13, we would go, we would go play football in the backyard and we could throw, all throw and catch. And then we'd go to middle school and start playing football and pretty soon nobody could throw and catch. 
So it just tells me it's – and I used to say this to my junior high coaches at Conference Cove. It's not, it's not about the kids being able to throw in catch. It's about you not letting them. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, uh, question three, and this is uh, – and you've, you already – you started out and you hit a lot of this at the beginning, but question three was what are the three best things you do to build culture in your program? And you kind of went through – uh, do you want to use those those, those three things? Yeah, I, I think those three aspects, you know, teach honest effort, communication, loyalty. Have a way to teach it all year round. And that's what the off season was about. Awesome. And uh, number four, and this is a big one, especially coming from a legend. What do you know now that you wish you knew when you first got started? Well, I, really, I wish I'd <laughs> – we developed develop this offense. I think in that book, The Perfect Pass, Sam Gwynn said it took 14 years of frustration for Hal Mummy to finally figure out the game. And, and uh, yeah, certainly I wish I knew uh, all the stuff I learned in putting together the air raid. And I've already mentioned the people that helped me. Um, you know, I, I obviously you would like to start with that base of knowledge. And, uh, the, the, you know, the, probably would have had a lot more success a lot sooner. Well, and I and I I don't know if I we said this when we were on when we started recording or before, but you know the things you were doing in the early '90s. If we could list the the amount of things you were doing when you when no one else was doing it, and now they're just commonplace, including including culture, including building a, a positive culture and getting athletes out to play football and throwing it around. I mean, you really just you, you the amount of innovation you did. Uh, is just incredible, and that, and and I remember, you know, that was early '90s when you were doing it, and now, you know, me and Shane talk sometimes and just say, you know, we we want to run the offense like Hal did in the '90s, but we just wish they'd play defense like they did in the '90s. You know? Yeah, <laughs> they, well, the defenses have caught up a bit; they're a lot better now than they were then. We were way ahead of them at that point, uh, but still, that just it still it provides a challenge for you. But it, I still think the the principles are all there still. I, you know, I think the, uh, the thing that, that you really got to, you got to get across to your players is just that they're going to be allowed to have fun playing the game. And, uh, I think that's something that really guys like Mouse Davis and Lavelle Edwards were way ahead of the curve on that, you know, and you would look. Coach Edwards told me one time, I asked him how he did it. You know, we were standing on the sidelines, and Lavelle never coached anybody. He was just kind of the CEO. So at practice, you could walk up and talk to him, and he was very easy to talk to. And I said, how'd you do it? And he, he told me about how he, he had gotten the job at BYU basically because nobody else wanted it. And uh, that he decided he was going to hang his future on the forward pass because that was the only time they had had a winning season at BYU is when they had thrown it a little bit. And he said, we, we developed ways to do it. But the main thing they did was as we got good and we started recruiting better athletes, we resisted the temptation to become conservative. And I, and I think that really resonated with me. And, and uh, I, you know, I think it's something to keep in mind for a lot of guys because, you, you know, you can, you can get so you, uh, it, particularly in college football where you can recruit, you know, you get that one tailback or that one running quarterback and all of a sudden you change your whole system for him. And then pretty soon he graduates and moves on and you look up and you don't have a system anymore. That's, that's an awesome point. All right. And now, now we're at number five. The, uh, the best way to contact you is probably uh, people who are watching and, and listening. It's through your Twitter. Is that the, is that yeah. the best way? Yeah. They can go on Twitter and, and uh, get it. Um, I'd like to, <laughs> That's Air Raid certified. Yeah, Air Raid certified. If they want to sign up for that, they can get the whole offense and they get to take a test. And, and to, actually, there's three tests involved. And, and uh, once they pass it, I'll help them on their resumes. I did that because I started having so many people visit for two days and then call me and say, hey, will you call his superintendent and help me get a job? And I don't really know the guy. You know, I don't really know if he knows it or not. So well, I, I, I want to talk about that part of it. I want to talk yeah. about that part of it too, but it, so the Twitter is, is it at how mummy is that the best, the Twitter? Yeah, that's, that's what okay. I mean. And then you have the at air rate certified. You can do either one. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, and then 
you you just started talking about your uh, your certification program, which is an awesome program, and I see so many guys that are that are getting certified. But here's the one I want to add in. You know, it, what makes it different than, than all the other ones, number one, you get from the Godfather, but the, uh, the access that you give them to you is, I think, what makes your program far and above everyone else's. And I, and I told you this story, and I've told this at a clinic before, you know, almost every job I've ever gotten is because how mommy made a phone call. And every time I've ever gotten fired, how Mummy made a phone call that got me back into the fight. You know, that, that he said the right things that, that got me back into the fight. And, and I owe, you know, everything to you, everything I know about football, I learned from you. And now you're giving guys not only a chance to learn the system, but then you actually go the extra step and help them. And I know you, you even do a, a little deal where you help them uh, kind of coach them up on the interview process. So yeah, fantastic deal. You, anything else you want to say about your program? But I mean, highly recommend it. Well, I appreciate it, Joe. And you, you know, you were one of the early ones that I helped and, and enjoyed helping, wanted to help you and Bill Clark, especially. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoy doing that, but I'm getting older and I can't do this forever. And I wanted to have some way that that younger coaches would still have access to this. And so by doing this, they got to watch 17 videos. It's basically the whole offense, all the nuts and bolts of it, all the drills, all the fundamentals, all the game planning, all the practice scheduling. And then, like you said, the last one is actually a, an interview process, a practice interview process. And then they're allowed to put my name on their resume and, and I give them my cell number and their email. And I'd probably answer right now. We're up to about 450 coaches have signed up awesome. and uh, I've probably average about half a dozen a week that I try to mentor and help. And they're all, you know, trying to get various jobs at various levels. But so I just pitch in as much as I can. And by doing this, when they, when they get certified, at least I know I can tell if somebody calls me and says, should I hire this guy? I can say, yeah, I've communicated with him. I've, FaceTime with him and and uh, he seems like a bright guy and, and I for he, I know for sure he he knows our offense. Well, uh, that's you know that's fantastic and that's you you've helped so many people along the way and this is just a another way that you're helping guys is is to learn the system and then have access to you to to be mentored by you. You know I feel like I've been mentored by you. everything I know about football. I learned from you and I feel like you mentored me personally and then from a distance for, for years and that's before you even had this system that you have now so, it, so coach i appreciate everything you've done for me and, and for all the coaches and i appreciate you being on this thing uh you know I, I i love listening to your stories i we were at a clinic together last year this time yeah. and, and I, so I when i when it was my turn to talk i said i've heard every one of those stories and i t still took like 12 pages of notes <laughs> just because you know they're always uh, there's always so so many nuggets in those stories, and and uh, and getting to, to learn it straight from you is is just uh, not only is it powerful, but it's an honor. And I and I thank you for being on this thing, Coach. Oh, my pleasure, Joe. Anytime, as always, you know, you you and all those guys at Valdosta really hold a special place in my heart. Well, thank you very much. You, you same same here. Thank you very much, Coach. See y'all. Have a good day.